Krishna career in AI, and then in order to speed up uh, logic computing, he got interested in parallel processing, and he was an uh, overachiever there too, until, of course, the big data revolution and his interest in data mining, machine learning, which bring everything together. In fact, you know, now, of course, he stands with uh, on top of 300 plus papers that he published, 10 books, including a book on uh, parallel processing and a book on uh, introduction to data mining, which, in fact, I uh, use in my, in my classes very much. He's now at the University of Minnesota, where he occupies the chair, uh, William Norris chair, and also uh, other dis has many distinctions, including, of course, an award um, on parallel processing by Tripoli, and a word uh, on KDD by the KDD, uh, you know, ACM KDD organization. So without any further ado, let's welcome VP with a warm hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. This is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, so this talk is about uh, what can uh, machine learning and data mining community do to address some of the biggest challenges that are facing our uh, society in the area of climate and environment. And this um, domain of climate, climate and environment sciences. Oh, okay. Maybe. Oh, it was not on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working now? A little bit? Okay. So the, um, the climate and environmental sciences domain uh, used to be uh, very sparse with data uh, until about a few decades ago. And like many disciplines, it has gone through a transformation from being data poor to extremely data rich. And it sort of started happening uh, uh, to a great deal with the advent of satellite technologies about 50 years ago. And you have a whole bunch of satellites just from NASA scanning the Earth, and they are literally hundreds and hundreds of satellites from different uh, organizations in different countries. Uh, and then you have, um, as the computers became faster over the last many, many decades, the models, uh, the computer models to simulate the, the environment of the Earth became much better in quality. And you can see at the top over there, uh, one of the models from NCAR uh, simulating uh, the entire climate system, and you can see the, the, the movement of moisture around the Earth. And if you watch it carefully, you can see the hurricanes forming and then all sorts of um, uh, events uh, you know, uh, that, are, that impact everybody. So between the sensors in the sky and the models and all sorts of other uh, data that you collect, this, this domain has become extremely data rich to the point that we have literally hundreds of petabytes of data uh, being collected in, in, in a year. And, and and then more. So the climate, climate change research now, uh, not just us, but the people who work in climate science, they call it a big science. They like to call it a big science, comparable in magnitude and importance and, and complexity to human genomics and bioinformatics, which went through a very similar transition starting about three decades ago when people started sequencing gene, genomes and such. And now, of course, nothing could be done in that community without uh, informatics and without uh, machine learning and data mining. So with all of this data, the question is, uh, are we ready to answer many of the questions that face our society, especially given that this is the, the golden age of data science, in the sense that we have data from all sorts of places, and then it's revolutionizing everything we do in our life. Uh, pretty soon, the, the, the automated cars, the self-driving cars are already there, and, and, and people predict that in another five, 10 years, majority of the cars would be driving themselves. You see uh, computer programs learning automatically and then beating the champions in, in, in very, very complex games. And of course, anything you do um, on, your, um, on your personal, uh, on your PDA or, or, or any in your, in your life, it's impacted by uh, uh, the big data technology. So the question is, can I take all of these methodologies and techniques and use them to solve uh, the environmental problem? And it turns out that it's pretty challenging uh, for, for a number of reasons. The nature of the data that we face in, in, in the climate and environmental sciences is actually very different than the one that involves uh, the data 
that is used by companies like Amazon or Facebook or, or even Google and so forth. Mm, uh, and, the, and the primary reason is the data that we are collecting about the environment happens to be, can be collected at multiple resolutions. We could be capturing phenomena at different scales. Uh, the phenomena could be varying in both space and time. And uh, by its very nature, the, uh, there could be a lot of noise uh, and uncertainty in the data uh, and, and so forth. And, and all of these uh, things make the traditional techniques extremely challenging uh, to use uh, from uh, traditional textbook techniques to, to be very difficult to use. Then there's another complexity that sort of comes up, which is both a opportunity and a challenge, and that is much of this data that we are talking about, about the climate environment, is, has an underlying physical processes that are sort of generating it. And, and which is why, uh, uh, the, and, and if you're able to capture uh, that aspect of the, uh, of, of, of the data, then there is a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to really leapfrog uh, the power of uh, big data technology. So, so in, my, in my talk, you will see uh, examples of how machine learning has to be advanced, but in many cases, you would see that how, in those advances, how do you bring in uh, the quote unquote the physical properties of the data to, to really make the advance? So, a lot of these uh, um, uh, topics and problems that we are addressing are in the context of, uh, I mean, th this research that I've been working on has been going on for, for almost two decades, but more recently, it has been funded by a, an expedition project from the NSF, uh, Understanding Climate Change with uh, a, a data driven approach. The idea is what can the machine learning and big data technologies do to, to help us understand more about the, the climate uh, and its impact uh, on the society. And what you're seeing here on this slide is a sample of few of those major projects. Uh, it's, and it's a, a project that sort of spans multiple universities um, and, and multiple disciplines, have the team is, is computer science, and have the team involves people from art sciences, hydrology, and many, many other disciplines. Um, but, but then the, the problems that are being addressed basically have, they're, they're trying to address a specific problem. They deal with certain data and that they need development of new algorithms. And just to give you an example, if you look at the top left corner over there, what you're seeing uh, in that animation is the animation of the height of the ocean observed from the satellite through altimetry. So it's a very complex process. The altimetry uh, uh, data would be collected by shooting radar streams down to the, uh, to the earth, and that sort of tells you as to how high that, that location is at any given time. And, it, and it, it, the data is processed, and then you can sort of convert it into a graded form, and you sort of know exactly why, what the height of the ocean is at any given time. You're seeing the raw animation uh, animation of the raw data over there. But the key question from the, uh, the scientific perspective is given this data, can we figure out what are the patterns of interest? And in this particular case, the patterns of interest happen to be the eddies in the ocean. So eddies are like storms, in, not in the air, but in the ocean. So water is always circulating, moving around from one place to the other. And as it does, it moves the, the, uh, the nutrients, uh, uh, the planktons, uh, and energy from one part of the ocean to the other. And exactly how this dynamics, what this dynamics is, and how it has been changing over a period of time, and what its impact could be on, on, on people is, is very, very important to study. And, but you cannot do that unless you have, you have sort of a catalog of, of the dynamics in the ocean. So, so it, requ it required development of entirely different kinds of pattern mining algorithms. And once those algorithms were developed, it, it was a, those algorithms were used to build a catalog of multiple decades of the dynamics in the ocean. And then, of course, that data set and the algorithms are available to the wider scientific community who study uh, the oceans. So this is, this is sort of a work that has been very widely used in the oceanography community. On the, on the top, middle uh, 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 section, what you're seeing here is the representation of climate data as a network. 
And, and, and what's unique about this is that once you are able to represent the data as a network, then a huge number of techniques that people study in social network analysis and other become applicable. And, and, and of course, even though they have to be modified to, to, to handle the nature of the problem, but then it allows you to study all sorts of patterns and, and teleconnections uh, in, in, the, in the climate that were not known to before. So, and this is an example where a whole bunch of new methods have been developed to understand relationships in, in space-time data sets using uh, network-based approaches. And then they have led to entire discovery of entirely new climate phenomena and the results published in top uh, journals in, in climate science. And, and of course, the sort of the, the examples sort of go on. And rather than covering all of them, let me just talk about one more uh, example here on, on this side where uh, the idea is that a lot of the time the phenomena in, in, in not just climate science but many other science and engineering disciplines, you're, you're part of an engineering college here, so almost everyone outside except for this department, people are studying systems, physical systems, and, and using physical knowledge. And these systems would be sort of, these models would be built uh, using uh, things like law of conservation of mass, conservation of energy, uh, based on physical knowledge. And, 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 and they're trying to sort of use those models to study some complex phenomena. And oftentimes, those models are not perfect because your understanding of the physical system is in, incomplete. So they end up introducing certain parameters. Uh, uh, and, and those parameters values have to be then calibrated using sample data, input and output observations. And at that time, the, the problem becomes much closer to the problem that we solve in machine learning. That is, you have the inputs and you have the outputs. The training set, you have the input samples and you have the labels. Can you construct the function? And it turns out uh, that there are many situations where the, the problems cannot be solved just by physical models alone. The problems cannot be solved using quote unquote, the machine learning model that I call empirical model in many of the scientific disciplines alone. And a, a new uh, paradigm is emerging which sort of says, can we combine these two approaches, which is sort of also called the physics guided data science approach or the theory guided data science approach. So that's a very, very exciting direction. And, and it again is also part of, of this project which is sort of um, uh, progressing. Today in this talk, I will just focus on one aspect of, of this project, which is being able to detect changes uh, in the surface of the Earth uh, using satellite data, and what are the challenges that sort of come about in being able to do it, and what are the societal implications. So this is about detecting changes uh, to, to, to sort of monitor the state of the, uh, the ecosystem. And the data that I'm going to sort of talk about in the rest of the talk would primarily be satellite data. Uh, the previous slide sort of talked about all sorts of data, model data, satellite data, other kinds of data. But here, I'm talking about just the satellite data. And the satellite data comes in, of course, many forms. One that I'm particularly going to talk about is this uh, sensor called MODIS, which is on two different satellites launched by NASA about 18 years ago, uh, Terra and Aqua. And the satellites picture every single location on the Earth every day, at least once. So if you look up the sky, you're being photographed every day at least once. Okay? And, but it's a very, very coarse data set. It's a square kilometer would be about 16 pixels at most. Okay? For each of those pixels, the data is basically collected on the spectral signature that sort of those, those pixels would have. The data is being collected, archived, processed, and made available to the entire world's scientific and our community anywhere in the world completely free. So this is one data set. Before MODIS was launched in 2000, uh, 99, 2000, all of the satellite products were proprietary in the sense that you know, the countries who would launch it would keep it just for themselves and then not make it available. So about 20 years ago, US Congress basically um, approved this program and it took five years for the satellite to be launched. And it revolutionized um, uh, 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 the, uh, the understanding of the Earth on, on a global scale. Uh, and of course, since then, many more data sets became public. The Landsat, uh, which was launched about 45 years ago, 
its data sets were made public uh, about a few years ago, about five years ago. Europeans launched a more recent satellite called Sentinel and a series of Sentinels, Sentinel 1 and 2 has been launched, a uh, third one is coming. Very, very powerful uh, data sets at a much higher resolution, about a trillion pixels on the globe, every pixel uh, uh, giving information about 10 meter by 10 meter, and you can literally map dynamics uh, of things that you could not imagine before. So there are all sorts of such data sets, and then these are all public data sets. Uh, and then, and of course, to top it off, there are many other uh, private enterprises that have data sets uh, from very cheap satellites that don't, 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 uh, that don't stay up in the sky for very long, but they provide high quality red, green, blue images of the Earth um, uh, on a continuous basis. So this basically is a tremendous opportunity uh, of massive amount of data with huge number of challenges. I'm going to talk about uh, some applications. And, 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 and doing some really cool work. And, and just to give you a sense of how this data might look like, I'm just giving you, like the data is coming raw from, from the top left corner. You can create mosaics of the entire globe every, every day, you know, if the data is every day, uh, which is a spatial uh, context, and then they will look like this. That is, if you took that data and you computed the greenness of each pixel, then this is how the, the image of the Earth might look on a typical day. This happens to be the month of July uh, in a certain year. And just by looking at it, you can sort of figure out where are the rainforests, where are the deserts, where are you know, the cold areas, and, 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 and yeah, you can sort of get a sense. Or you can look at a specific pixel and see how its greenness may be changing on a given day. And you see a pixel over here on which you can see the greenness going up and down every year until about 2006 when it comes down quite a bit and then has a slightly different pattern. And this, ha this pixel happens to be the China Convention Center where I gave a talk in 2012. Uh, and this is the location where they held the Olympics in 2008. And two years before, uh, it was all big farmland and they cleared it. You can sort of notice that. And then, of course, they, they built the stadiums. And today, if you go there, there are beautiful apartments and grass. And you can see the greenness. And that's the signal that you're seeing here. So it's, it's amazing as to how much just very a simple data I can sort of tell you. Okay, so this is the nature of the data. Now, the question is, what can we do with a huge number of things? Uh, a tremendous opportunity here, but I'm going to only talk about three uh, examples here and give you sort of a bird's eye view of the three examples given the short amount of time I have. So one of them is going to be about being able to map the the fires in the forest on a global scale. Now, this is of course a very very important problem, and perhaps this audience doesn't need to be motivated very much. You know, you are in the middle of of this, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, a lot of this is happening because of the very complex interaction between climate change and, 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 and its impact on, on the forest uh, health uh, as the, uh, the warming sort of makes the forest drier uh, or uh, uh, multiple uh, reasons there. And then it sort of promotes the burning of this forest. And as a result, uh, burning of this forest lead to the uh, feedback mechanism, more greenhouse gas being emitted, which sort of leads to the uh, uh, cycle, which is very, very uh, tricky and, 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 and damaging. And it turns out that being able to map uh, 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 these forests on a global scale requires an entirely new methodology in machine learning. Uh, and I'm going to sort of talk about that at, at somewhat greater length. How do you predict rare classes in absence of ground truth? That is, I don't have the good labels, and I'm dealing with a rare class, and how do I build a predictive model? Uh, and using this, uh, how, how do you build um, uh, this information on a global scale? Now, being able to uh, find these forest fires is important not only because they feed back into the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, 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 for, for the atmosphere, but they also happen to be precursor to vast amount of deforestation that happens in the tropical forest. So oftentimes, people would burn uh, the trees and then convert in the tropical areas like Amazon and Indonesia, and then convert them into plantation. So you see here uh, a beautiful uh, patch of, of uh, hundreds of square kilometers in Indonesia, in you know, little circles. And these are all oil palm plantations. Okay? Now, where is it used, oil palm plantation, oil palm is used? You open your kitchen pantry, and almost everything that you will find there will have something that comes from here. 
Okay? It's a huge industry. It's, it's a, initially, it was, of course, promoted as a source of renewable energy, but it turns out very quickly people figured out that it's an absolute disaster on an on a, on a environmental scale. Uh, the amount of carbon that you lose from converting these dense forests in Indonesia and Malaysia into this plantation is, is, is just a big, big uh, uh, penalty to the environmental uh, resources. So, so this has become so serious that some of the world, uh, I would say many of the world's largest corporations have promised not to source anything that originates a, from a supply chain that starts from these deforested lands, okay? uh, especially in, in the recent year. Except that you don't know uh, when somebody's supplying you a product, where is it coming from? You just don't know. You, it's coming from somewhere, right? And uh, Cargill, one of the largest corporations uh, in the space, happens to be based in Minneapolis, and they sort of said, look, we wanted to, we made the commitment, and then we wanted to figure out, can we sort of figure out which, where our product is coming from? Of course, you can find out the product is coming from this plantation, but how do you know that that plantation actually was deforested recently, or is it has been around for a long time? And they said they hired a company, uh, and all they could do was download these Landsat images and try to uh, demarket these things by hand, and which is a hopeless, hopeless progress, right? So being able to create these maps can sort of uh, uh, help address a, a huge uh, environmental problem for which people are committed to help, but, but they don't know what to do. And again, it requires development uh, of, of some very interesting technology uh, that could look at the evolution of these, uh, uh, of a location over a period of time, because the reason this problem is very hard is that a forest looks green from the sky, and after you build a plantation, it looks green from the sky. Okay? And the tropical areas, uh, after you cut them, they become green so fast, uh, it, it's very hard to figure out what, what really happens. If you look at the images from the satellite, most of them, they're cloudy, they're missing, and whenever you see them, it could be green here and green here next year, but how do you know what happened in between? And it turns out that being able to model the dynamics uh, over a temporary scale can be, can be very, very critical. That's the second problem I'm going to talk about, rather very briefly. And the third one I'm going to talk about uh, is being able to map water on the surface of the Earth at a level of resolution in space and time that has never been done before. Okay? And that's a very, very interesting problem. It has huge uh, implications, huge applications, and actually one of our major collaborators right here at UCLA, Professor Levin Mar, he's a, he's a leading hydrologist in the world, uh, and, uh, and it required development of uh, completely different approaches to, uh, to do machine learning at, at, at many, many different levels. And I will, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give an ap application of this technology, but only talk a little bit about what sort of goes into it. And why, and just to give you one example of why this might be interesting for people to look at, you, some of you might remember about a year ago uh, uh, in February, uh, of 2017, uh, Orwell Dam was filled up to the top, okay? And people were worrying that it's going to break and it's going to wash away communities uh, down the stream. And, 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 the, and that area, that Orwell Dam, sometimes looks like this, sometimes looks like this. And the people who are managing it have to figure out how much water to release, okay? And if they release too much, they may end up looking like this at a time when the water is needed. And if they release too little, they may be sitting here, and then more rain is falling, and they don't know what to do. So just, just you can imagine uh, the, the kind of decision people have to make. So, so this, this sort of gives you that, yes, these issues can be very, very important from many, many different perspectives. So now what I'm going to do is very quickly uh, try to give you a sample of how uh, these problems got solved, how, what we achieved uh, by applying machine learning, and what were some of the innovations that were brought in. Uh, and again, it'll just be a sample on each one of them, you'll have to read the papers to sort of uh, go any further. So the first problem of being able to map forest fires may seem the easiest problem to be able to tackle from the machine learning perspective. Why? Because you would think that it should be very easy to find training samples. Okay? If nothing else, I can look at satellite data, and on some days I can see, oh, this looks brown. So this must be the burnt area. Uh, this, this is typically usually forest is burnt area. So I can get samples from here, samples from here. I can build up a training set, and I can use a training set to feed into my favorite uh, 
regression models, support vector machine, or neural networks, or what have you. Okay? And once I have, um, uh, and my features are, of course, going to be the spectral observations that I get from the sky, you know, that, that kind of coming in for each pixel for each time at any given time. And the target label could be burned or not burned. Zero could be not burned, one could be burned, or whatever you want to give it. Except that I have to deal with this problem as if I don't have label. And the reason is that for certain part of the world, these labels are available at a very good quality, especially California. California probably does some of the best mapping of forest fires uh, anywhere available in the world. For the last 20 years, for every single year, the state of California would issue a map and give you the, the polygons for each year, saying these are the locations that got burned. Canadians do a pretty decent job, too. But for the rest of the world, either there are no labels or they're horribly bad quality. Australians produce labels, but, but they're really, really poor quality. And especially for the region where we really need the attention the most, the tropical regions, the Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Africa, there's hardly anything available. Very, very poor quality. And to top it off, if I, build, if I use the labels from California and I try to apply them in tropics, very poor results. If I build, if I take the labels from California and apply them to Georgia, I get very poor results. So, so there's so much heterogeneity both in space and time that this thing really doesn't work. So we'll, we'll, we'll build up a machine learning model thinking I don't have labels. I don't have good labels. Eh? But if I don't have any labels, how am I going to work? But I am going to assume that I have imperfect annotations of extremely poor quality, such poor quality that they're useless by themselves okay, in, in certain way. But they're available not just for the training set, but for everything. For every single sample, I should be able to uh, have some sort of a label. So, so I'm going to assume complete absence of labels as we need them, but, I'm, but these are going to be imperfect labels. Okay? So that's, this is the first assumption. Second thing is, oops, am I going the wrong direction? So second thing is, the, the problem that I'm dealing with is highly imbalanced. Uh, I guess the most recent season in California was one of the worst season in, for forest fire. The one before was 2008. Uh, the Santa Barbara fire was one of the biggest one. And I think the, the one most recent season surpassed everything. But even then, only about 3% of the fires, the forest area, was burned uh, total. Right? So which means if I have an algorithm which calls every pixel to be not burned, would have given me 97% accuracy. Completely useless model has no value. So which means the, the traditional measures of performance that are sort of, quote unquote, built in into the traditional algorithms don't really work. Okay? So you have to work under the situation that your target class is, is rare, usually going to be more rare than, than and you have to make sure that your machinery works in that context. So that's the second problem. And the third problem, of course, uh, I, I won't uh, talk about uh, the specifically, but this is a problem that you're dealing with, and, and your sign is all the real problem, which means you have to figure out how you build the machine learning model. You know you don't have training labels of the kind that you really need, and you want to be able to build the model, deploy it, and then how do you know that what you deploy is really working? which is how do you evaluate the performance of a model uh, when you are working this, in, this, in this situation? And it turns out that it's a very challenging problem, and, and yet there are situations, assumptions, under which you can build bounds, you can compute bounds uh, on, on your performance, and then they can help you figure out exactly how good the model is. So this is the big picture. Again, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about uh, a solution to it, but, but uh, I'm going to be able to give you only a very incomplete picture of the solution. And uh, to give you a sense of what I'm trying to solve, in a traditional machine learning framework, I want to work with the left label, left table, which is which has features and a good label. Okay. Good labels means, let's say, blue and red are the two different classes, positive and negative. And if you give me representative labels uh, of my uh, population, I can build a model, and then I can apply this to unseen samples. But I don't have the left table. What I have is the right table, okay, in which some of the blues have been flipped, and some of the reds have been flipped. Okay? So alpha is the probability of flipping a blue label, and the beta is the probability of flipping a red label. If alpha and beta happen to be both zero, I'm in good shape. Okay? 
but what I'm dealing with is a situation where alpha and beta both are non-zero. And then, then the question is, can I work with the right table pretending that it's the left table and how far can I get? Okay? Can, I, can I build a model that would work? Can I build a process in which I will work with the right table but it will give me a result that will be really as good as working with the right table. Okay? But just, just to sort of go on, so what might be the imperfect label? And if you remember, I sort of said the imperfect label have to be available for every sample, not just for your test sample, uh, not just for a training sample, but for every sample. So, so that has to be available everywhere. So for the burned area that we are interested in, my target label is this, this guy, this, this pixel burned or not burned, right? For the forest here, but did the burn or not? But the imperfect label that's always going to be available to me from the satellite, very poor quality, although in California this imperfect label is actually not that bad, is called thermal anomaly. It's also a, a output you get from the satellite sensor, which tells you whether the pixel at that time had a temperature higher than normal or not. Okay? And it turns out that if there's a fire burning and if there's a view from the sky very, that's very clear and the satellite is on top, it will see a temperature anomaly, and then you will catch it. But oftentimes, the fire may have burned and finished, and the satellite just came in a couple of hours later or just passed by a couple of hours earlier, and then it will miss it. Okay? Or it could be that fire is burning, satellite is up there, but there's a cloud in the middle, and it missed it. So there could be a lot of reasons why it, the thermal anomaly would miss actual event of a fire. And there's a lot of reason where thermal anomaly may catch something else. There could be a fire burning in a, in a farm nearby, and it might think there's an anomaly in this area, and then it might sort of give a signal. So it has both huge number of positive and negative uh, uh, errors. Alpha and beta are both uh, uh, non-zero. And, and, and different part of the world, these alpha and beta are very different. In California, they actually are not so bad. But in the tropics, where we really need it, they're extremely bad. And then the list goes on. If I'm trying to map the urban settlement, the nighttime light could, could provide me the alternate information if I'm recommending items to end users, I could use interest rather than using individual interests, I could use my friends, circles and trust as, as, a, as a surrogate and, and so on. So this is what I am working with. Okay? Now just to put things in the context uh, of the bigger machine learning literature, supervised learning is a, is a very broad topic. Oftentimes we work with labels that are given to us that we can trust as being correct. And if I have sufficiently many training samples, all sorts of methodologies will come into play, including decision trees, logistic regression, support vector machines, deep learning, what have you. But if you don't have enough samples, I will work with things like multi-view learning, active learning, multi-task learning, and so on. But none of these branches apply to what we're talking about because we don't have expert on our sample. What we're dealing with is imperfect labels, which is on the right side. Okay? Now, once I come to the imperfect labels, there is one domain where uh, people have a lot of experience in our community, which is being able to work with imperfect annotators. You know, if you're trying to get images labeled or some questions being answered, you will go to Amazon Turk, you will hire a whole bunch of people who would, for pennies, would label a whole bunch of images, but then you don't know who they are, they could be doing a very poor job, so you hire a whole bunch of them, and each one of them is, is making the, the annotation, and it turns out that because these people are all different, they will make errors that are completely independent, and if they are, then you can reconstruct the actual state just by looking at the correlation among all of these annotations. So this area of multiple annotators is very widely studied and, and, and pretty rich topic. Can't use this technology here because I only have single annotators. It's very hard to find single annotators, right? But here also they have been work when between the alpha and beta only one of them is zero. The other, one of them is non-zero, other is zero. And that's called partial supervision and very interesting work done in this direction. We don't have this. We have both of them to be non-zero. And within that category, people have done work in the area of balanced uh, data set that is both positive and negative class are balanced. And then, then there are certain results that are uh, pretty interesting. And we don't have that. We have a rare class. And this is the, the sort of the hardest problem in, in the big context. But the work that we came up with builds upon this and this and others and, and to, to solve this problem. Okay, so, so now, and, and actually, even though this problem looks very strange, and, uh, but it has been studied for a long time. So first, let me give you a sense of, if, if you want to be able to solve this problem, you have to, of course, make some assumptions, because this, you can't just say, give me imperfect labels, I'll solve the problem. Right? 
So one of the problems, one of the assumptions people made in this area is that the alpha plus beta should be less than one. This is a very, very mild assumption. Alpha and beta, of course, if they're very large, what you have is a garbage, right? So alpha plus beta less than one is a very, very mild assumption. But the second assumption here is an extremely important one. This, um, this one says that the errors that are being made on the label are conditionally independent. It's called the class conditional uh, assumption, CCN assumption. That means that the imperfections are not biased in a certain part of the space. And what, what, what that means is that if these are the true labels of the two classes, circles and crosses, and let's say if they're going to be corrupted, that if some of the circles became red, that means they're going to be flipped to red, and some of the circles over there became red to be filled to crosses, then there is no bias in this process. They are being changed all over the place. So this is a good, this is a corruption that, is, that has a CCN assumption. And this would be a corruption that is, does not have the CCN assumption because there is a subspace of the feature that is getting more corrupted than the rest. So this is not allowed, that is allowed. So this, this assumption, this is a very, very important assumption. So once I make this assumption, then it turns out that the work on this problem goes back at least 20 years. The very first paper on this topic appeared in about 1998. Uh, Blum and Mitchell wrote the first paper on this topic, which sort of said, well, if, and it was a completely theoretical paper with no solution on how to do it. And it's basically, it sort of studied in a theoretical sense that if I'm given the right table as opposed to the left table, can I possibly build a model? And what that paper sort of says is that given, if, if the CCN assumption is true, then given sufficiently many samples, it is possible to work with the training set from the right side, and it, will, it should be possible to build a model. I mean, actually, it was existential proof. So there was, there was a theoretical result. Then it turns out that about five years later, Bing Liu uh, uh, at University of Illinois, Chicago, and, and his team came up with another uh, cut at this problem. They're saying that if al between alpha and beta, beta is zero, but alpha is non-zero which is only the partial corruption, and CCN assumption, I can then come up with a machinery, an algorithm, it's a proper machinery, in which I can optimize precision and recall uh, using only the right table, but it will work as good as if I had access to the left table. Very, very important advance. And, and some building blocks had to be used from there. Then about uh, 10 years later after that, there was another paper uh, in NIPS which sort of said, Oh, if the classes are balanced, and even if alpha and beta are both non-zero, I can work with the right table and still get the same accuracy, optimal accuracy, even though I may not know what my accuracy is, working with the right table as opposed to getting from the left table. So that was, again, a very interesting result. It, there were no proofs in it, but they sort of said it, it seems to work. And then, more recently, just about three years ago, another piece of work appeared in ICML, Menon et al., which sort of said, oh, which actually had you know, lots of interesting theoretical results. And one of them was that I, for a whole bunch of evaluation metrics that are applicable when the positive and negative class are balanced, not the rare class, I can work with the right table, optimize my classification algorithm, and it at the end is going to do as good a job as it would be if it was constructed using the left matrix. But still, if I have an imbalanced class scenario, and if I have both alpha and beta to be non-zero, and if I work with the right table, I can get arbitrarily bad result if I don't have the left table. So basically, it, it's, it's not a solved problem. So this is the problem that we solved in this, in this piece of work, which I'm not going to go any further than just sort of saying this is the problem that we're solved. And what this does is step one, solving this problem is, is the step one of this paradigm that we have, which sort of said, I'm going to run a classification model using imperfect label that's as good as the one that could be built using perfect labels, using this condition that alpha is non-zero, beta is non-zero, class is highly skewed. And the result from the, and again, we, we sort of showed, not only you can do that, you can come up with bounds, and you can sort of tell how, how bad this thing would be. But it turns out that step one isn't good enough in the sense that it, the classification machinery that you build, even though it is as good as it is going to be using perfect label, but it doesn't do a good job of, of, of really doing the proper maps of the forest. So it had, the algorithm has multiple other steps that are dependent upon 
success is the first step, step two and three. I'm going to skip that. And what I want to just show you is how these results play out uh, in, in reality. And first, I'm going to show you the results for California because California, the maps are, are very well uh, mapped. The fire forest fires are very well mapped. So I have the ground truth label for each year. Okay? I'm picking up, actually, this is only for one of the years. I forget which year. And the ground truth, of course, has a perfect recall, 100% recall, because ground truth knows everything. And perfect precision, there is no error in it. We assume that at least. And if I build a classifier using the ground truth, my classifier is not going to be as good, of course, as the ground truth, right? So it is, it's able, I'm able to build a model that catches about 85% of the fires. And of the fires that it picks up, 40% of them are, are good fires. So this, that's the precision. So this tells you that this is how far I can, I can get using ground truth. So this is step one. The, step, the question is, this, for the question for step one is, can I do as good with imperfect labels as somebody could do with, with the perfect uh, label? And this is how the weak labels look like for California. Not, not too bad. But I'm, if I build a model using the weak labels, which is the location over there, what, this, what we're able to show is that the results built using the weak label, which is the, the triangle, is almost as good as the red label. Not too far. Slightly worse, but not too far. But then the step two and three of the algorithms come into play, and they shoot up the, the precision up, and then the recall in the step three. And of course, this is dramatically better than anything that you can imagine. And of course, same thing uh, applies to you know, different states where we know sort of the ground truth. But what really is important is how does this machinery really work in the tropical forest where the action is. And this is, this is this of course, this algorithm sort of is able to, to map uh, forest fires in the tropics around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, given the importance of this problem, there are already uh, projects, uh, uh, you know, the, the products from NASA that sort of give you the maps every year. Uh, for forest fires, which are pretty good for most of the world except for the tropics. And it turns out that in this part of Amazon and Indonesia, the amount of uh, locations that are considered burned by the NASA state-of-the-art product are shown by the blue circle. And what you are sort of seeing by this red circle is the, the one that, that the, a very conservative version of this algorithm sort of finds uh, to be burned. These things are available through a public viewer and uh, have been verified and, of course, published in the, in the, in the top quality remote sensing journal. So this is like a validated product which sort of shows that, yes, this is a tremendous improvement over the state of the art. And just to give you a sample, just to give you a feeling as to what this might be, uh, in, in action, I'm going to show you a region in the Amazon rainforest uh, in, in Brazil, uh, the northern Brazil. And you can see uh, a Google image from 2002 and you can see it's very, very dark green, except some white area that are, that are clouds, except some locations around uh, highways, which you can sort of see the, uh, some deforested land. Now, the same area, if you look at in 2015, about 13 years later, has a lot of white space. And they're all deforested land. And if you just to get a sense of how deforested it is, each pixel is a square kilometer, a tiny little pixel. So very, very large areas have been converted into a deforested land. Now, if you look at this image over here, this is the image that sort of tells you which locations our algorithm considered as burned. Okay? And you can see this location and this location, this map and this map, they almost look like, if you watch it carefully, every feature that you see here, you'll find a feature over here which sort of shows you the burnt location. So this is almost like by doing the monitoring of the burnt classes, you can reconstruct what happened in the deforestation uh, uh, thing. So this, is, this is sort of tells you how accurately you can measure uh, these areas. So, and again, of course, this story sort of goes on uh, around the globe, and I'm going to show you uh, the example of this in Indonesia for mapping the oil palm plantation uh, as, as a consequence. But before that, let me just mention to you that being able to map plantations uh, in Indonesia, of course, I mentioned to you, is, is very hard because the forests go from green forest to green plantations. Uh, so they look uh, very, very similar. And uh, to be able to solve this problem, a whole bunch of organizations they have tried to build these maps. Uh, but they're all incomplete, or, or they are available only for certain years. So there's an organization called uh, TP, which is an trans organization called Transparent World. They built one map in 2014 for all of the plantations in Indonesia. And you can sort of see the map in the top left corner. The only problem with this map is 
that have the location that it calls plantation are actually not really plantation. Another organization called Roundtable and Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO, created map one for 2001, one for 2005, one for 2009, which seems to be more accurate except that it's highly incomplete. It's most of the locations that are plantations are not covered by it. And the big challenge is can you build a complete map that is dynamic and uh, using a machinery that I'm not going to be able to talk about due to shortage of time. Uh, this is sort of the recurrent linear network approach to sort of analyzing the space-time data set. Uh, you can sort of build these maps and you can sort of see all of these red areas are plantations as of 2000 and all of the green areas are sort of annual increments, four, five, six, seven, and you can sort of see. So you can actually map for each pixel when it was converted from uh, uh, plantation to, to non-plantation and exactly what's happening everywhere. And one of the biggest utility of this is being able to figure out what are the processes people are using to convert these plantation, forest to plantation. So if you look at this uh, map here, this is showing you all of the locations that were plantation as of 2014, all of the green locations. Okay? Next chart is going to convert some of these green locations into red locations. Now, red locations that of these green locations, subsets of these locations, red locations are the one in which people just burned the forest and converted them into plantation, which is actually a completely unsustainable practice. It's a crime to be able to do that. And you can see more than about half of these locations actually were burned, which is really bad. If you are trying to put a plantation, at least you should cut the trees. If you get a license from the government, they would expect you to cut the trees, move the trees away, and then put the plantation. These people are simply burning them. Okay? But when you are burning a region of the forest to put your plantation, the fire that you start isn't going to respect any boundaries that you only wanted to build this plantation in 10,000 acres. So really to find out exactly what happened, all of these areas that are in blue are the ones that are collateral damage. Okay? So, so basically, somebody was trying to build a plantation here red plantation, well, they, they built it, but then they burned everything around it. You can see all of these areas with massive amount of collateral damage. Now, all of this mapping of forest fire was made possible by the first uh, approach I talked about. So it's basically in combination, you can actually build not only uh, how the dynamics of deforestation is happening, and exactly who's following the law, who's not following the law, and who, who's, uh, uh, um, whose supply chain should be accepted and who's not. So this is, this is actually, a very, very actionable result. So in the remaining 10 minutes of my time, I'm just going to cover the very last topic rather quickly, and that's being able to map the surface water on the Earth uh, 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 at a very high resolution in space and time. Now, why is this problem interesting? Because the surface water, of course, is very important for, for everybody, and it's changing, and it's changing because of the, the climate change. You can see that. Uh, in melting glaciers uh, in Tibet. That's a picture that's shown here. In 84, this area looks like all frozen and white. And on the right side, you see uh, all water, just like the, the area sort of being melted. Impact of human actions. You see Aral Sea on the left side here, big freshwater lake. In 2014, it, hardly anything is left here. You might have read the newspaper recently. Uh, Salt Lake, in the Salt Lake City, not too far from here, has shrunk to about half its size, okay? And it's exact the same phenomena that happened here that's happening in Salt Lake. That is, uh, this is a closed basin. This is being fed by two different rivers. The water got directed uh, for agriculture, and then and you have a disaster, which is sort of, uh, which changes the ecology of the region and, and, and so forth. So there are many, many reasons for, for which you want to be able to map the surface water dynamics. And, and very importantly, uh, uh, it can be used to quantify the stocks and flow of water, you know, how much water is flowing, how much water do we have on the earth, and how the water is flowing from one place to the other. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very, very, very important input to it. You can use this information to also calibrate the hydrological models that are used for all sorts of things, including flood planning and, and management of dams and so forth. Now, this is a problem in which it was so important that the ability to map the, the surface water NASA in, 2000, in, in February of 2000 launched a special mission of the space shuttle just to map which locations on the Earth are water or not. 
So which means I have plenty of labels because I have labels from one date for the entire globe. Uh, uh, this is called the ground truth on specific date February 2000 uh, from shuttle uh, uh, space, space shuttle mission and which sort of the data got converted into many, many public data sets. So we have the, the training set from, from NASA's space shuttle. We have the data for the globe on every single day from the different satellites. And I can simply use the ground truth and, and the model to sort of be able to do it. Except that it's a very challenging problem because the how the water and land looks at different locations and different times on the Earth can be very different. So it's highly heterogeneous in both space and time. And just to give an example, in just a small region of Africa, converting the spectral data into something that you and I can see, red, green, blue composites, it looks like this in Egypt, from one part of Egypt, it looks like this in another part of Ethiopia, it looks another part of Africa. And you can see, of course, you can all imagine that middle parts are all water, but the combination of uh, spectral values look very, very different in all of these, both for land and, and water. Here's a lake in, in Argentina where it looks very different at two different times. So with this heterogeneity, the model that you build at one place at one time may or may not work in other places. So this is a big challenge. The other big challenge is the data that's being analyzed is coming from the satellite. And satellite data is not always perfect. And it can be impacted by clouds, shadows, all sorts of issues. And what you're seeing here is an animation of data for uh, a, a, a lake called Poyang Lake, not too far from Beijing. It's, it's a freshwater lake that used to supply water to the city of Beijing. And anytime you see a pink color, the data is missing. And you can see the data is missing most of the time. Okay? That's one part. Now, if the data is missing, it's actually not as bad. At least you know you don't have the data. What is even worse is the data, you think data is there, but it actually is wrong because you know, you're seeing it from the satellite. So because of the missing data, you may have no labels, or you may have incorrect labels because of the poor quality. So all of these challenges actually make it very, very difficult to build a model that can work uh, around the globe. And again, this had to be handled by using uh, sophisticated ensemble uh, techniques to build a classification model, but then using some aspect of physics uh, that sort of helped a great deal uh, in, in the entire uh, uh, project. And the, the aspect of physics here is that the water bodies get formed in a cavity. That means if a location B is being called water and location C is being called land by your classifier, one of them must be wrong. Okay? So if I have the elevation information, I should be able to use this to update my classification results, except that I don't have the elevation information at a global scale, at a level of resolution that I need it. So the question is, how do you design an algorithm that makes use of this information without using the elevation information? That is, it knows there's a water that's being formed in a, in a cavity, but I don't know where the cavities are and how, how deep the cavities are. And it turns out that it's a very, very interesting problem, not too different than the methodologies that people use in robotics SLAM approach. That is. If I have a robot, if I know my location, I can map the whole room, but I don't know my location. But if I knew the whole map of the room, I can find my location. I don't know either of them, but I have to sort of figure out uh, how do you go from one to the other. And it turns out that similar kind of approaches can be used here. So basically, these collection of techniques have been used to build a model that uh, maps the water on the surface of the Earth and there's a location here, z.human.edu slash monitoring water. You can go type it and, and see the dynamics of water on the entire globe at your fingertip. Uh, it, the, the, the viewer, of course, gives you the dynamics of every single water body uh, that is larger than two and a half square kilometer, uh, about 10 pixels or, or more. And you will see uh, uh, all sorts of phenomena, including a very complete picture of melting of glacier lakes uh, in, in the Tibetan Plateau morphology of rivers changing, dams being constructed all over the world, and, 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 and so forth. And I'll, I'll, given the shortage of time, I'm just going to go through very, very quickly. So this is how, if you, if you maintain, you will see circles, blue circles. These are the water bodies. You can sort of go in. This happens to be Don Martin Dam in Mexico. The system, uh, the web interface, will sort of tell you how big this dam was, 400 pixels. It came down to very few pixels, then became bigger, and so forth. Yeah, the history over the entire period uh, of time. You can verify uh, this by looking at the annual uh, Google timeless images uh, 
to see that yes, is it is it really the same thing? And it turns out it is. You can also map each of these colors, the dots into the dots that are increasing or dots that are decreasing. So green, in the, in the case, green dots are decreasing and red dots are increasing. And you can find all sorts of phenomena, for example, a whole collection of green dots, what's happening here? It turns out it's a very large area in Argentina where uh, because of agriculture, the whole area dried up. A and it went you know, from like almost 10,000 pixels, almost one to 2,500 square kilometer of water disappeared in this, from this area. And you can sort of see in time lapse images from every one of these pixels by, by simply clicking. You can, I promise to you by that you'll be able to see the glacier lakes uh, on a global scale. You can see all of these red dots uh, 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 on the Tibetan Plateau. They just showed up in the viewer, and all of these red dots are going to show you the increasing glacial lakes. So you can sort of see these are the lakes that, are, that were there before, and the red areas are the ones that increased. You can see them everywhere, and you can see these areas increasing by using the time lapse. You can sort of see all of these areas that are red have increased very, very recently. So before this, people would study one Landsat image for one year at a time. It would take very, very long time. And here now, at your fingertip, you have the entire area available to you, and you can sort of study the dynamics as to how much water has appeared in the Tiburian Plateau from the melting of these glaciers and what's going on. You can study uh, the, uh, the changing of the rivers, how the rivers are moving around on a global scale. You can see, uh, you can see the, the islands being shrinking. So you, you see there's an island here off Southern America. And if you watch this carefully, you'll see the degradation. It's like the sea level rise. The island is sort of uh, going under. So you can see all sorts of phenomena. You can see dams being constructed. This is one in Japan. You can sort of see dams being constructed all over the world. So studying dam is a very important uh, problem for, for hydrologists. And there is a database they have built called Global Reservoir and Dam Database, which was kept very well until about 2000. And since the last 20, 18 years, they, haven't, they are basically relying upon people to self-report. So this is how many dams it says it, they were built since 2001. This is how many the system just finds automatically. Just sort of say, hey, look, I can tell. These are the locations we had very small water bodies before 2001. And so suddenly, in the recent year, they have just gone up. So very, very easy to do. And, and, and sort of to go on. And again, uh, I'm just going to take maybe one minute to sort of tell you that these, these algorithms can then be modified to construct image of, of, the, of the mapping of the of water on the Earth. Even though we are looking at the MODIS data, which is daily, which is very, very coarse, we can actually construct a very fine grain image uh, 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 from the data set. And, and I'm not going to tell you sort of much more than the fact that there are, this is, the, this is how a MODIS coarse image might look like on a daily scale. And it turns out that it's possible to convert this image into something as precise as this, which is much, much cleaner view uh, of every, every day. And so if this is how the, the uh, uh, the Lake Mead looks like. Lake Mead is, is one of the largest freshwater lakes in, in the U.S., and it supplies water to California and, and many other states. So this is how the, the high-resolution image looks like for, for this lake. This is how the map got constructed uh, using the algorithm. This is what you will see on the interface. But this is how that map can be changed into looking at for every possible way. And just to sort of see how precise this map can be, I can go zoom in. And this is how the initial map is. And using some information transfer scheme, this is how it's going to look. OK, now let me go further. Uh, this is how the map looks very jagged. And after I apply the information transfer, this is how precise it becomes. Now, you might sort of say, what's happening here? It's actually not too different than what you might have seen. That is, I have these images here, which are very coarse images, 8 by 8 images. If you look at this image, you don't know what you're looking at. And people can reconstruct from these images a face like this, which is something that you can recognize. And of course, this mapping from the course to find is constructed using having a huge amount of data. Okay? Now, for each lake, if I had a huge number of observations, both at high, observ uh, high resolution and low resolution, I can use the same super resolution techniques to go from left to the right. Except that, in my case, I'm using the underlying physics to reconstruct the left image into the right image. 
So this sort of shows you the power of being able to use physics. And of course, there are opportunities for combining both of these approaches. But in this particular picture, I'm just showing you that I have a view of the, of the, of the phenomena at a coarse level. I can reconstruct it at a very, very fine level using some very mathematical transformation because I know the physics. Uh, of course, you know, here, I'm going from here to here you know, just by uh, uh, using uh, the plenty of data. Okay, so I guess I'm out of time, so I'm just, let me just conclude by saying that big data offers huge opportunities uh, for uh, understanding, increasing our understanding of the, the climate and environment, but also to advance machine learning, because a lot of these techniques that I talked about, they have been used in many, many other directions. So for example, this, this being able to merge the, the, the physics and the theory along with machine learning, that's a paradigm that's catching huge attention, not just in the climate science, but areas like you know, hydrology, um, uh, uh, people who study fluid dynamics, uh, special mechanics, they all are, uh, are able to sort of see the applications of this. So there are huge applications of, uh, of this methodology of bringing physics and data together. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, it, it sort of helps you solve many, many interesting problems. Let me just conclude by uh, saying that we have some of the students who have been working on this project. We have collaborators uh, all over uh, uh, the world, but especially that some of them are from UCLA right here. Professor Dennis Lattenmeyer, who's a leading hydrologist in the world, is also uh, uh, working with us on, on one of these this problems. So with that, let me stop here and, 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 and thank you for your attention. Yes, question. Right. So this is this is uh, being able to map is the first step usually, and then after that people like to study the phenomena, right? So for example, I showed you one example of the oil palm plantation. So there the idea is that the forest fires were the beginning and then the end I'm seeing the plantation. So that's definitely a man-made act. A lot of these fires in California, you're not plant putting a plantation there. It's the Santa Ana winds coming in from, uh, uh, from Mexico and then and, and sort of fanning the fire, right? So, so basically, uh, if you have good maps of these fires, then you can use them to study interactions between these fires and the, and, and the natural phenomena and the human actions. And, 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 and together, sort of, you, know, you take the next step. So in the case of plantations, you can figure out this plantation was burned. If you discourage purchasing any products coming out of those plantations, people will stop burning them. Because then they know that if I burn some area, somebody will figure out that I burned it, and then they will not buy any products from it. I'll blacklist it, so why, why should I burn it, right? So it, it's, it's the, um, uh, so, so basically, this is one of the steps in, in, in the big picture. Yes. Okay, sure, sure, certainly. Let me, let me take both, and the, and the first one was, can you remind Okay, so, so that actually, if you look at the, if you just create a, a mapping, a heat map of locations that have poor quality data, you will find all of the world's largest cities. So wherever people live, you know, we create enough, enough, enough uh, dust, aerosols in the air, and it becomes very, very hard for the satellite to see anything. So that the re dense population and also the, 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 the pollution, basically the cost, right? So, so when you see the pollution in the air, that's basically, uh, if, if LA has a smog on a certain day, the data collected on that day would be extremely poor, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the quality part. Second part, actually, is let me just bring it back to this picture here, right? So a so, 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 number of things here. How could somebody go from here to here. It's because if you know that your data set comes from a set of images, then you know that if these things look white, it must be a nose. 
and the nose has certain structure, and the machine can reconstruct that structure. Instead of giving a data about face, if I give it something completely different, if I just take a picture of this uh, um, pattern on the carpet and I put it here and I try to reconstruct it, it will try to find something garbage, right? So it's not going to work if I take arbitrary data. It's, it's working from, from a low resolution image of a face and it's learning mapping between low resolution image of a face and high resolution image of a face. Now, I could apply exact same technique to doing this mapping, provided if I had huge many samples of lakes that had high resolution data, low, low resolution data, and high resolution data. But I don't have that. I, I barely am able to construct just this. So the question is if I only have this and I have no more samples, can I still reconstruct that such a powerful image? And if intuitive, in the beginning it seems very un unintuitive, but it turns out that if I know the elevation structure, then using a series of mathematical formulas, you can say that you can reconstruct. The only time the reconstruction will not work very well is when your elevation information is incorrect or if it is changing with time, like the reverse change morphologies, the, the deposit salt, or the earth can move up and down, right? And those are the situations in which it would be, it would pay to sort of combine these two approaches in the sense that you sort of you sum from the model and you use some from the data and then you see if you can, you can bring them together. But the upper machinery is done completely based upon uh, uh, physics. All right, I guess no further questions then. Thank you.